Okay, Chair, we're in public session. Thanks, Clark. Uh, can I give everyone a warm welcome to the Education Committee and ask uh, broadcasting to keep members in the spotlight for the next few items. Agenda item one is apologies. Are members aware of any apologies? No? Okay, then agenda item two is chairperson's business. The Minister of Health has written to the committee in relation to contact tracing in schools. Can I refer members to correspondence from the Minister of Health at page five of your meeting pack? So, um, the Health Minister has provided information on the definition of close contact for tracing purposes in schools and links to a public health agency site providing information on positive case numbers in schools. Do members wish to respond to that correspondence or note that for now and we can return to it? Note it. <coughs> okay. Agenda item 2.2 then is the research and information service briefing paper on the executive's draft investment strategy for Northern Ireland. Can I refer members to the briefing paper produced by Assembly Research on this strategy at page seven uh, of your meeting pack? Um, the committee will be briefed by the Department of Education officials on Tuesday, the 15th of March on the education budget. If members are content to note that information for use at that meeting, agreed? Yes, agreed. Thank you. Okay, can I also refer members to correspondence from the NI Fiscal Council at page three of tabled papers? Let's check that. The Fiscal Council states that it has not considered individual departmental budgets in depth. And sorry, could I, if you, people aren't speaking, could they maybe go on mute? I think I'll maybe improve the audio. Um, the, the Fiscal Council has stated that it has not considered individual departmental budgets in depth and therefore would not be in a position to provide detailed comment on the Department of Education's budget. Um, uh, seems unfortunate. Um, perhaps we could consider asking the Fiscal Council or asking someone with the power to ask the Fiscal Council to consider the education budget in depth. Members, any views on that? Clark, what is the format for <clears throat> asking the Fiscal Council to consider a departmental budget such as education? Um, I suppose they're just new chairs. So they, I mean, they, they produced a report, a general report um, on the budget and touched on each uh, department and the committee was given that. So maybe, um, you know, more in-depth work is kind of ahead of them, but I'll liaise with the clerk for finance um, and find out a bit more, you know, about what the, the fiscal council is planning to do um, and how to schedule them. But it just, we were hoping to have them on the 23rd. Um, so that's unlikely to happen now, this mandate. Okay, I, th I think it'd be interesting to go back to them. I note that in relation to education, they do say, um, we note that the Department of Education received the second highest share of the executive's resource allocation, 18% in 24 to 25, a rise of 4% in real terms against the department's 2019 to 20 outturn position, table 4.4, Education also receives the second largest general allocation, 185 million in 2022 to 23, against a request of 435 million. In overall terms, the department's average change in resource funding over the three years of the draft budget is an increase of 7.8% against its baseline. In relation to capital, education receives 10% share of the executive budget in 2024-25. Our, public our Guide to Public Finances in Northern Ireland also charts the gross spending for the department over the period 2016-17 to 2021. Members be content to um, investigate the scope for asking the Fiscal Council to take a, a, a closer look at the Department of Education budget. Agreed? Agreed? Okay, thank you. 
Item 2.4 then, members, is a research and information service briefing paper on newcomer pupils in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's on page five, five of tabled papers. Are members content to note and to bring back any issues raised therein? Agreed? Okay. Great, yep. Thank you. Agenda item three then is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 2nd of March and the 3rd of March at pages 52 and 57 of your meeting packs and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, then no, there are no matters arising. And agenda item five then is correspondence. Can I refer members to page 63 sure, where we sure. are? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sure. Who's that, Justin? Justin McNulty. Go ahead, Justin. Uh, apologies, Chair. Um, my my um, connection's not so great. Very quickly, I was, at, I was on the picket lines last week with the educational support workers who are up in arms that they are feeling that they're being um, treated very unfairly in terms of their pay you know, in comparison to their equivalent in the health trusts, they are all specialists. They play a vitally important role in terms of uh, resolving issues and helping children who have fallen in hard times and families who have fallen in hard times. And that number of families has increased significantly since the onset of the, the pandemic, given the lockdown, etc. They need, they need, I think, uh, support in terms of their demands. And would it be reasonable for us to write as a committee to the, the minister to say, we we support the education support workers and and their call for parity and their call for equality and pay and pay to their equivalents in the health trust. I'm content for us to write to the minister in that regard, and indeed the education authority management team is is with us momentarily, Justin. If you want to put it to them as well. Okay, I will do. Thank you, Chair. That's the education yeah. welfare officers, Justin, isn't it? Yeah. It is, yeah. Yep, um, uh, members can tend to agree to write to the Education Minister and, as I say, we have an opportunity to raise that with the Education Authority Management Team shortly then as well. Thanks for raising that, Justin. Okay, members, that brings us back to correspondence on page 63, where we have 15 items of correspondence and a summary note of page 64. Clark, do you wish to speak to the correspondence, please? Certainly, Chair. Um Okay, members, item 5.2 on page 68 is a response from the Minister of Education providing data on pupil absence rates and initiatives taken by the department to improve these. The Minister states that it's anticipated that the levels of positive COVID cases in schools are likely to continue to reflect the reducing levels of cases in the wider community. Um, members, do you have uh, any views on that response? Obviously, the data... Clark, most recent data shows that monthly attendance levels have been falling across both primary and post-primary sectors since September 2021. And in January 2022, primary attendance was 91%. With the, so 9% of pupils were not in school. Post-primary lower again at 89%. Um, Perhaps the members would be content for us to write to the Education Minister to ask how much of a concern that is and um, what exactly is being done to mitigate that absence. Members content to do that? Yeah, content for that, Chair. Hmm. Members, any other comments in relation to that correspondence or again content to uh, note and, and review and return to it? if necessary. Agreed. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Clark. Um, okay. Um, item 5.5 on page 79 is a response from the Department on Physical Education in Schools. Um, the response includes data on the current level of physical activity, um, actions it's taken to encourage PE, and details of its engagement with the Forest Schools Association. 
Um, the department has also indicated that neither it nor the education authority hold ed information on how many schools have outdoor green facilities for physical education, including access to standard sports playing pitches. Um, so I know this is one that's been close to members' hearts. Um, do you want me to follow up again on this? Um, Absolutely. Even yeah. Sure. Yeah, the, 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 the data on physical activity in schools um, is, is appalling, um, both from a, a, an up-to-dateness and, and from what it tells us. Um, the information about the amount of time schools allocate to PE is collected by the school omnibus survey, which I understand is a, a voluntary survey. Um, the last survey was conducted in 2018, four years ago, um, and information provided by schools which responded to the survey, which I understand was 67 post-primary schools and 248 primary schools, um, is, is broken down by primary and post-primary school. Now, my understanding is that the guideline for PE per week is two hours. And in primary schools, um, the percentage of primary schools that responded breaks down as zero minutes to 60 minutes per week, 37.8% of schools. 60 minutes to two hours is 57%. And only 4.8% of schools that responded have two or more hours per week. At post-primary, that is not the one hour, 26%, one hour to two hours, 63%, and two or more hours, um, 12%. So in, in primary school, almost 40% of schools are getting one hour or less per week, and in post-primary, 27%, one hour or less per week. We, we, we debated this at the assembly. Um, and I passed a motion, um, part of which was an amendment that I, I put forward to consult on these guidelines becoming statutory requirements. The minister has never actioned that assembly agreed uh, amendment to consult on those guidelines being statutory around PE. Um, and it, it continues to be startling, just that I'm just as passionate about um, and sport as yourself in this regard, and you'll probably want to come in on that yourself there. Absolutely sure. This is shocking, startling, starting that the department doesn't hold information on what schools have access to pitches on their site. That is incredible. It's starting that they're comfortable with the fact that there, there's such high percentages in both primary school and post-primary school have less than one hour's physical activity per week. It says... It's scary to think of what the downstream impacts and implications of that are on our health system, but not alone on our health system, on the children's welfare, children's well-being, children's mental, physical and emotional and spiritual well-being, which is, they're all connected. And the physical piece is, the, is almost the most important piece. And uh, this is for children of, of all abilities. I'm not talking about for elite athletes, I'm talking about for children for all abilities to be physically active and the importance of that. And our education system seems to forget that. It seems to, to just let slip on slip by without any emphasis or any focus. It's just disgraceful, totally disgraceful. Two schools in my own constituency, St. Catherine's and, and Neary High, St. Catherine's Armagh, Neary High, and and where they've no they've no sports pitches. It's just <coughs> shocking. And, and our, our department doesn't even know that. What is going on? I would, uh, Justin, if, you, if you'd support it, I, I, would, I would recommend that the Education Committee in its legacy report recommends that the next Education Committee conducts an inquiry into physical education in schools. I support that. Yeah, I, I think we're at that point, folks. Obviously, a two-year mandate limited the, the extent to which this Education Committee and... and the, the pandemic limited the extent to which this committee could conduct inquiries, but hopefully with a, a five-year mandate in front of it, uh, the next education committee could provide the necessary attention to this issue. 
Uh, mem members content that we include in our legacy report a, a recommendation that the next education committee consider a, an inquiry into physical education. Agreed, Chair. Thank Agreed. You. Thank you. Okay, Clark, back to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, um, by item 5.6 on page 86 is a response from the department providing an update on the pilot of Operation Encompass in Northern Ireland. Um, this is in relation to the SL1 that Justice, uh, the Committee for Justice is looking at um, and uh, the Department of Education has the lead role in um, pupil notifications about domestic violence. So um, uh, the department has indicated that following the pilot's extension in February 2022, over 100 schools are now included and the feedback has been very positive. Um, so members, I think our first action would be to forward that to the Committee for Justice um, to help them with their SL1 scrutiny. Are there any other actions that members want to take in regard to that correspondence? No, I, th I think you're right, Clark. The, the rollout of Operation Encompass clearly is helping schools to be aware of yeah. domestic abuse incidents at home and, and empowering them to um, respond positively to help the children when they're in their care and in their schools. So, yeah, I'm content to forward that on to the Justice Committee to make sure they're aware of that. Members agreed? Thank you, Chair. Ju Justin Thank might you. want to turn his camera off there as well. <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Clark. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. Item 5.7 on page 90 is a response from the Department regarding the Gambling with Lives pilot program in post-primary schools. Um, I think Robin maybe asked um, for an update on this uh, project and the department is confirming that although it met with uh, Gambling with Lives and wrote to the schools to bring the pilot to their attention, it didn't have any direct involvement in that. Um, Robbie also is usually interested in um, gambling from his APG role. Members, does anyone want to comment on that? I, I know the correspondence refers us to the gambling lies with program manager uh, for Northern Ireland. That uh, again, maybe a, a future committee would seek to request a briefing from the gambling with lies program. Members are content. Sure. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, you're right. In the time we have left, um, that's sensible. Item five eight on page ninety one is a response from the department. Um, to the committee from for the executive office regarding the fair employment school teachers bill um the department states that given the impact on all education sectors of any amendment to the article 71 exception of the fair employment and treatment northern ireland order 1998 or FETO, as we would normally refer to it the process to repeal the exemption must be completed in a measured and fully informed manner the minister is therefore not supportive of the proposed process um, members, have you got any actions you would like to take on that basis? My understanding is that that is a dynamic issue, <laughs> a fluid issue. Um, I think members are aware of it in, in, other, um, in other fora as well. Uh, I, I'm obviously proposing this bill, so it's, I, I never wish to... Uh, it, indulge or take advantage of the fact that I'm sitting in the position of chair here, but um, I, it stands to reason as the proposer of the bill, I, I do feel strongly that there is scope to pass the bill in this assembly mandate and I'm, I'm working to that end and um, meeting with the executive office committee later today, as I understand the department is. I'm also in uh, direct contact with the department to see if uh, if there is a way um, to uh, progress the bill before the end of this mandate, but do I, 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 do members wish to take any opportunity to say anything about the the bill? It 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 obviously directs uh, fundamentally to teachers, which are firmly in the remit of the education committee, but has that quirk of being fair employment law that is the responsibility of the executive office. But members want to say anything in relation to the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill um, that is set to complete the Executive Office Committee stage this week. I'm content to note. Content to note. 
Okay. Thank you, members. Thanks, Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, on uh, item 5.9 on page 93 is a copy of correspondence um, from the Committee for Justice to the Department of Education, and it's regarding the pooling of budgets uh, to deliver children's services. Um, really, it's asking, um, you know, is there pooling of budgets or why isn't there pooling of budgets um, as per the Children's Services Cooperation Act 2015? Um, so members, if you're agreed, and um, we can request that the department copy its response to that letter to this committee as well. Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Um, item 5.9 on page uh, 95 is correspondence from the Committee for the Economy regarding a feminist recovery plan as re produced by the Women's Policy Group. Um, the Women's Policy Group has produced one of these for each department. Um, so members, if you're agreed, we can forward that to the department um, seeking a response to the issues they raise. Agreed. Thank you. Um, item 511 on page 137 is correspondence from an individual. Again, it's about PE, but in this case, it's regarding a lack of integration in PE sports across schools from the perspective of the commentator. Um, members, are you content to forward that? Uh, letter and commentary to the department um, seeking a response to the issues that it raises. Agreed. Um, thank you. Item 512 on page 139 is correspondence seeking to engage with the committee on a collaborative project with Azombwe and the British Council looking at creating new narratives between young people from Africa and Northern Ireland. Um, obviously our timings, um, our, our lack of time <laughs> is problematic here. Um, I'd like to ask members for their views. I mean, um, we could try to have a meeting before dissolution or just refer the correspondent to the new education committee after the election. I think that might be, that might be necessary, Clark, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, item eight, uh, 516 on page 163, um, is correspondence regarding concerns about the Integrated Education Bill. Um, again, uh, we've received um, several letters like this in the last uh, couple of weeks, and we've dealt with them all um, by referring members to the, referring the correspondence to the committee's report on integrated education and the process that was undertaken. Are members content that we write to these correspondents as before? Agreed. Thank you, everyone. Uh, item 517 on page 13 of table papers is correspondence from the department regarding um, an SL1, um, so the beginning of the statutory rule process for the Teachers' Pension Scheme Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022. Um, the purpose of the rule is to close the, off the legacy 1998 Teachers' Pension Superannuation Scheme to future accrual and to move all active members into the 2015 Teachers' Pension Scheme from the 1st of April, 2022. Um, the department has offered to brief members on the proposal. Um, it, it is related to the McLeod judgment as well. Um, members may want to ask um, NITC primarily tomorrow um, for its views on that um, and to see if the FDE can, can brief us um, before the end of, of the mandate. And I think that would be something? useful. Yeah, that'd be useful, Clark. Agreed. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. That's that's me. Okay, members. Are members content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary note at page sixty-four, with the clerk's exceptions? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Agenda item six then is board work program on page one six five of your meeting papers. Clark, do you want to speak to the board work program? Yeah, members, I went through it in, in detail um, last day. Um, we, we still haven't, we, we're, we're going to be setting up the, the 16th um, at the planetarium um, because uh, in, indicative um, timings for next week are not, are not uh, predicting a, a Wednesday sitting. Um, I will check in with you directly um, just to get numbers for that. And I propose that the committee should do it as an informal meeting. Um, so that uh, there isn't inordinate pressure on on everyone to attend, but um, I think it'll be a really interesting visit. Um, 
Um, Clark, I, 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 know you're, I know you're determined to get us <laughs> out of our buildings and our rooms. Um, the, pre predicting non-Wednesday sittings in the last two weeks here is, is possibly um, premature. Risky. Yeah, risky. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I regret that. I, I, I know it is the commitment of this committee to engage um, externally as much as we possibly can, but um, that could be a hostage to fortune. Um, and I, I would prefer to disappoint in advance than have people at, at advanced stages and then disappoint as well. Um, perhaps members could have a think about that and communicate um, offline about the, you know, the likelihood of us being able to make that type of a visit. Okay, so the alternative will be that um, the same briefings are provided uh, by the Starleaf in in virtual format. Um, so I'll I'll be in touch with members about that then. And we haven't heard back um, yet from uh, the minister's office um, about her potentially attending um, the committee before the end of term. Um, so there's there's a little bit of. Um, work to be done to pin down what we do on the 23rd. Okay, members. Thanks, Clark. Uh, so then tomorrow we have the Northern Ireland Teaching Council. Yep. Um, and the 15th of March, is that Tuesday next week, Clark? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. The budget, the uh, budget briefing. Yep. Yeah, so do you briefing us on the budget and we will okay. have, um, uh, provision of some research uh, analysis of the budget as well just to assist with that so that we can use that session to feed into the legacy okay. report on and then the 23rd of March we're doing our best to get the education minister for a final day briefing then yeah we haven't heard back yet no we haven't heard back yet we have offered her actually the 22nd and um, yeah okay. as well yeah. okay okay members content to endorse the forward work program as amended agreed Agreed. Agreed. Thanks, members. Okay, then that takes us to agenda item seven, which is the Education Authority briefing from the Education Authority leadership team. Can I ask broadcasting to remove members from Spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a brief from the committee clerk at page 170 and Education Authority briefing paper at page 172? Education Authority papers and responses previously considered by the committee at page 185 to 190 and Public Accounts Committee memorandum of reply on the impact review of special educational needs at page 18 of table of papers. This was accepted by the Department of Education last April and primacy of the PAC over the report ended at that point. It's open to members to ask questions about EA's input and perspective on the recommended actions should they wish. Can I give a, a warm welcome to Sarah Long and I think a number of other witnesses, Claire Duffield, Director of Human Resources, Neil Hanna, Director of Operations and Estates, Seamus Wade, Director of Finance, Una Turbot, Interim, Director of Children and Young People's Services and Kim Scott, Director of Regional School Development and Philip Miller, Head of Communications. You're all very welcome and can I advise that you have up to 10 minutes for an opening statement followed by questions from members. Sarah, we can't see visual for you at the moment. Um, we can. I can. We can't, no. Can you hear or, me, Jim? We can hear you clear, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I propose then what I'll do is I'll make a start on my opening remarks since you can hear me. And while I'm uh, addressing the committee with my opening remarks, we'll try and get the technology <coughs> sorted out here so that you can see us all as well after all Thank the you. this morning. Okay, Thank good you. morning, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to brief you and the committee this morning. I am joined by the EA corporate leadership team, who you will all know, and also by our head of communications. The committee had indicated that you would like an update on a number of issues, including the review of the Education Authority, special educational needs and communication, which we are more than happy to cover. As this is likely to be the last opportunity for the EA leadership team to address the committee before the next mandate, 
I thought it was important to start this morning by paying tribute to our school leaders, our teachers, staff, our children and young people and our parents for their tremendous resilience, fortitude and courage throughout the last two years. It is very clear that the pandemic, a once in a lifetime global change, has had a profound impact on education, health, economy, wider society, and ultimately on all of our lives, on what we value, what we prioritise, what we do, and how we do it. On behalf of the EA, our sincere thanks goes to our school leaders and to all staff working right across the education sector for their outstanding commitment, dedication, and professionalism in the face of the most difficult of circumstances where children and young people and school communities have remained at the heart of everything they continue to do. So a sincere thanks to all. In relation to the education reviews, as you will be very aware, there are two reviews ongoing. The landscape review of the Education Authority being undertaken by Baker Tilly, who were commissioned by the Department of Education, and the wider independent review of education. In relation to the landscape review of EA, we welcome this work and have been engaging constructively with the review. I understand that it is progressing well and that Baker Tilly have been engaging with a wide range of internal and external stakeholders, including a call for evidence, which is live at the moment. As I said, the review was commissioned by the Department of Education and they have set the terms of reference scale and scope of work being carried out. We do look forward to receiving the outcomes of the review which will help provide a platform for moving forward. In relation to the wider independent review of education, we have also been engaging with this review and the EA board had a very constructive meeting with the panel held at Wellington College in February and are planning further sessions. Moving on to special educational needs, which I know has been a key issue for this committee during its term. <coughs> Driving forward the transformation of Northern Ireland's special educational needs system remains a central priority for the Education Authority. There has been much work undertaken in recent years, and it is fair to say that the EA and the wider system has been on a journey of improvement. Significant progress has been made, but there is still much more to be done. The establishment of the Special Educational Needs Strategic Development Programme has been a major step forward in bringing the many complex strands of this work together in a strategic and holistic way. It has also allowed us to strengthen our engagement and partnership working with the establishment of a program reference group, which brings together the voices of parents, children and young people, key advocacy groups, and our wider education and health colleagues. However, it is clear that significant additional investment will be necessary in order to fully deliver the vital changes at both system and school level, which are still required. This includes sustaining our progress in improving the statutory assessment process, introducing new evidence-based intervention models, tracking the outcomes of those interventions more effectively, and ultimately delivering the high quality services that our children and young people need and deserve. This is something that the EA, together with all of our partners, are absolutely committed to doing, and if we look back at the last two years, significant changes in the SEN system are already demonstrated. An ambitious improvement project was put in place to drive forward significant transformation in the statutory assessment process. All of this work allowed us to reduce the backlog of assessment cases, which have been open for more than 26 weeks, from a significant number over 1,000 at the end of November 2019 to zero at the end of March 2021. Despite significant increases in referrals over the last year, we have been able to largely maintain that compliance. And at the end of February 2022, 11 cases have been open for more than 26 weeks. Looking at other areas, we have driven forward our corporate performance framework and our data governance strategy right across the EA, with expert teams being recruited and improving performance management across all of our services. In preparation for the current school year, a cross-directorate project was established within the Education Authority to tackle a significant increase in demand for special school and specialist mainstream provision. The project allowed £21 million of additional investment to be secured and additional 61 special school classes and 39 specialist mainstream classes to be provided, along with an additional 60 teachers and 140 classroom assistants. 
This intensive work ensured that every child or young person with a statement of special educational needs was offered an appropriate placement for September 2021. This work now continues, focusing on meeting an additional increased demand for September 2022. And looking to our long-term provision, we are delighted to launch our consultation in January on our draft special education strategic area plan for 2022 to 27. This is the first regional plan to specifically focus on creating a special education system for the future that can offer all our pupils the opportunity to achieve their full potential by having the best educational experiences and pathways to meet their individual needs. We do recognise that there is still a significant amount of work to do and sustaining progress is always challenging, but we are committed to continuing this transformation journey to ensure we meet the needs of all our children and young people. We have also been on an improvement journey to enhance how we engage and communicate with children and young people, parents, schools, our staff, media, political representatives, and a wider range of partners and stakeholders. We absolutely recognise the critical importance of strong and effective communication and engagement and have been listening to a wide range of views on how we can improve how we do this. As a result, we are developing a new communications and engagement strategy, which is very much child-centred and school-focused. This will build on previous reviews, insights and work to date. There will be a key number of building blocks in developing the strategy, but they very much centre around communicating and engaging clearly with children, young people and their parents, supporting schools in delivering the best outcomes for children and young people, building greater awareness of the work and impact of the Education Authority, building trust and better relationships, utilising innovative ways and channel, channels to communicate and engage, and taking an evidence-based approach so we can measure what we are doing and what the impact is. Some of the key steps that we will be looking to take forward as part of the plan include reviewing and implementing a new communication structure to ensure that the EA makes the best use of skills and experience both within the communications teams and across the organisation. Engaging with a range of key audiences, including school leaders, children and young people, our staff, as part of a continued development of the EA communications and engagement plan to enhance relationship and develop new partnerships. Developing baselines across media, internal communication, stakeholder engagement and digital in order to measure impact and success. Develop our stakeholder engagement and management framework, which will include a set of standards and principles informed by the UNCRC best practice to ensure that we engage in a more consistent and strategic way and developing a social media strategy and policy and increasing reach and engagement across EA social media, our website and our digital channels. Whilst progress is being made, again, we recognise and are firmly committed to developing this essential area of work further with our range of partners, including the committee. I would finally like to thank Finally, like to finish by thanking the Education Committee for all of your work, support and focus on ensuring that all children and young people get the best educational start in life, which is what we are all here to do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, let me to <coughs> echo your recognition for everyone in the education sector, and including Education Authority employees, um, for the, the beyond the call of duty um, dedication that has been demonstrated throughout COVID. Um, our education sector has demonstrated just how central it is to our very way of life in Northern Ireland, Just not just the education of children and young people and, and all learners. Um, and we will continue to do all we can to support everyone in that sector. Uh, we are short for time this morning, so can I move straight to members to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions and bring in the Deputy Chairperson, Pat Sheehan, MLA. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, sir, for that presentation. Sir, uh, we spoke previously about the uh, number of appeals uh, in, in, in regard to the statementing process uh, that were taken by parents of children who believed their children required a statement of special needs. And uh, the, the data that were given to us um, said that the EA either lost 
or conceded 97% of those appeals that went to the tribunal. Uh, has there been any change in that? Uh, and if there has, can you explain what changes have taken place? Thanks. Okay, thank you, Pat. Uh, first of all, I would say, um, in order to understand those trends, we have undertaken a very detailed analysis of them um, because we felt it was important that we understood exactly what the reasons for concession were um, so that we could trace that back um, in order to address them. So what I'm going to do is ask Una um, to uh, talk in a bit more detail about that piece of work and also where we are now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, yes, this is indeed something that um, that we are particularly concerned about and have been because, in actual fact, um, it probably has been one of the issues that has uh, impacted on public confidence in relation to decision making around the statutory assessment and, and review um, of children when they want to, uh, when they request um, a statement of special educational needs. Um, for that reason, we have carried out a forensic review. Um, it's a comprehensive review independent of the actual team that have been making the decisions in relation to, to the um, decisions. Um, it has thrown up a number of issues for us. We're at a final draft at this point in time, um, and we're at the point where we're actually sharing it with, with our SEND reference group. Um, that, that's the SEND transformation reference group to understand um, and get their views on it. We've just shared it with them and we're also meeting with Nikki to take them through the findings of that. There are a number of issues um, that, that it's highlighting for us and, and it has involved um, a review of case files as well as um, conversations and key focus groups. So there are a number of issues that have arisen including the terminology that we use. So for example, the very term concession. If a parent provides EA with information after the initial request that provide, that, that um, means we actually agree that a, a, stat, a statutory assessment should take place, then that's considered to be a concession. So 50% of the, the appeals um, or the concessions relate to that, to that very issue. So we're very clear that it's important to get the, all of the information at the point of referral where possible, but we will, we will always uh, be in a position where additional information is required. Um, and, and is submitted, and we will always take that into consideration and review our decisions. There are a number of recommendations coming from the from the report, and, and one of the key recommendations is access to stage three intensive support services um, in schools. Um, it's very clear that parents and schools are asking for strategy assessments because they don't have sufficient resource in schools to meet the child's needs. Um, so that is leading to an increase in the number of requests for statutory um, assessments. We're, we're also conscious that we need to do further work to make sure that we have consistent procedural guidance, um, that we have better use of the, this, of the DAR service, the Disputes um, Resolution, Resolution Service, um, and that additional efforts need to be made to get information and the right information to parents. Um, we will be working on criteria and we are very keen to work with others um, in, including the tribunal service itself, send us to make sure that we are that we get onto the same page, so we understand each other's perspectives, and that's something we look forward to doing. So it is to assure you that this is a matter that's been given very serious consideration. Um, there has been an extensive piece of work carried out. We have a set of recommendations that we're consulting on, um, and that we will take this this work forward um, in, in over the next um, six months. Okay, thanks for that, Una. And when would you when would you expect a report to go to the SEN reference group? We we, we have already uh, presented to the SEN reference group. They are going to give us their feedback in the next few weeks, um, and we will take all of their feedback back before we issue a final um, a final version of the report. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, I've raised before the issue of the perception of manipulation of the figures in, in relation to children with special educational needs and how quickly they're being assessed and, and, and so on. And I raised a case with you recently. I'm not going to go into the details of it, obviously, but it was a situation where uh, a young child who was due to go into P1 in September, uh, it was a child who had uh, complex special educational needs. The principal in the nursery, he attended um, 
uh, advised the EA of that. The EA tried to pressurise a local mainstream uh, primary school to take them in. They refused because uh, they, they hadn't the facilities to deal with his complex needs. And the, and the child remained at home until I actually contacted you. And, and I want to thank you for uh, taking uh, quick action to resolve that case. But how did that happen in the first place? Um, I, I suppose um, I mean, occasionally, and it is occasionally, we have situations where where we struggle to place a child um, um, in when they're preschool, um, and and we know that we are working very hard to make sure that places are available. When we don't have places, that does impact on the length of time that the statutory assessment um, is conducted. Because before we conclude it, we have to name the the school. We have to work um, and consult with schools and with parents and work through a number of options um, to make sure that we can find an appropriate place. I think where we are at is we, we've worked um, and are working with our IT departments to set up arrangements where um, every child will be known to us um, and that we can track um, every child from the point of referral um, right through. And, and I am confident that we are doing well in that regard. However, there are occasions um, when, when something happens um, that we need to take um, urgent action. And what I would assure you is that where, where there's any of those situations, we, we will act, as you, as you say, and make sure that we do whatever we can in order to secure an appropriate place in, in consultation and with the support of the family. And, and, and just, to, just to finish this off, because uh, I know we're pushed for time this morning. Uh, and, you, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And, you know, in, in every walk of life, mistakes are made and people slip through the cracks and, and so on. The difficulty in this case was that the Board of the Education Authority, uh, when they asked if every child who needed a placement in a special school had been given one, they were told that that was the case that there was no child who needed a, a placement in a special school who didn't get one. And, and my concern is uh, it's not that it was a mistake, uh, but that it's a mindset. Um, let's shuffle the numbers about here. You know, let's massage or manipulate the figures in, in, in some way. And, and, and I just hope that that isn't the case uh, and uh, we don't have a child and special needs uh, children in particular uh, need to be in school for their uh, continued development. Uh, and, and this child was sitting at home for, for five months. So, um, and, and, you know, by the way, I'm not getting at you. Uh, and I've always found you to be very, very helpful uh, when I have contacted you about issues. But I just want to make that point. Thank you. That's me. Pat, maybe if I could respond to that, um, just to say it's absolutely not a mindset. It's something that we take very seriously um, at the Education Authority, and it's something that we have put an awful lot of work into as well in terms of making sure that we can stand over our data quality, that we know where our children are, that we can um, but make sure we can track every child. As Una says, significant work has gone into that. It was something that our own audit of practice identified back in January um, of 2020 and extensive work has been done. So it's absolutely not a mindset. What I would say to you is there is never a finite. Children with special ed educational needs become identified right throughout the course of the academic year, as you'll know yourself. So there is never actually a, a, a point where we can say we have absolutely every child at that moment in time. That will continue to change. So the position at September, the beginning of September may not be the same position in the middle of September or at the end of September. But in terms of the mindset, you have my absolute assurance that this is something that we as a corporate leadership team and as an organisation and our board take extremely seriously. Chair, okay. I understand that the only way we can reset, uh, we can... Uh, Turn our camera back on is to reset, and I am conscious you are short for time this morning. So, if you are comfortable with us continuing verbally, we are as well. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Pat, thanks, Pat. Did you, any other questions, Pat? No, no that's me. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank, thanks, Pat. Um, thanks for that, uh, Sarah. Yeah, the the audio is clear, so I, I think we'll proceed with that. Um, 
Okay, can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA, please? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to the to the, uh, Sarah and her team this morning. I, I uh, I'm actually working very much in the blind, Chair, because I can't get the meeting packs today. So Sarah may not be able to see me, uh, but uh, I I can't even get our information packs uh, this morning. I only want to raise one question, uh, Chair, uh, with Sarah, and it's maybe a, a, a question in the longer term, because I've argued this at uh, when we start discussing the budgets for um, special, well, education department budget. Um, and I've noted on last year and questioned the Minister of Finance this year uh, again on it. And uh, if I look at the budget, uh, there is no budget line for special educational needs. It is a budget uh, and it's a composite. Uh, and it would seem to me, uh, and I, I believe this would be the mind of the committee in terms of how the committee have reacted to special educational needs and support for special educational needs uh, over the past uh, two years that indeed it may be it may be advantageous, I certainly feel it would be advantageous for me to understand uh, a budget line in the department's uh, uh, application for, for, uh, for, for finance if special educational needs was in there as an item uh, on its own. I wonder maybe, uh, Chair, could I just ask Sarah to, to react to that? Yeah, thank you, Robin. You're absolutely right. The special educational needs budget features as part of the EA block grant, and it actually represents around half of the spend of the EA block grant. Um, so you're right. I, I guess at a high level, it can be difficult to see exactly where the expenditure is and what that means. And that's something certainly Seamus is here with me um, this morning as well. It's certainly something we have been working with the department on as well, because I think the clearer and more visible um, the budget lines within the EA budget are, the clearer and more visible it is in terms of where our money is actually directed to and where it actually goes, because you'll know there have been conversations in the past um, related to that. When actually you disaggregate our budget lines, it's very clear that the majority of our budget is spent on delivering services directly to children and young people or <coughs> delivering services to schools to support children and young people. And, and aggregating them all up in generic titles is not always necessarily helpful, nor is it, it does it actually necessarily help us in terms of making sure that we can target um, our efficiencies, but also we can target where we need to direct our additional resource. Seamus, is there anything else you want to say on that? Thank you, uh, Chair. I, I guess what I would say is that, um, to echo Sarah's point, 50% of our block grant, or £382 million, pounds, uh, was spent on special educational needs in 21-22. I guess the point that I would highlight very clearly is that we've been working very, very closely with the department around the pressures on that budget. And despite the fact that it doesn't have its own earmarked um, budget line, if you like, the department has been very, very supportive in trying to secure additional funding for us. And actually, during the year, we secured in-year money of about £51 million. Pounds. So I guess I, I take completely the point that it might, it might help our, our collective cause if it was more clearly uh, set out in its own line. I, I think it would be fair to say that we haven't suffered as a result of that, and we have successfully managed to uh, achieve additional funding. The final point that I would say uh, in relation to your question is um, we are absolutely clear about the levels of spend in each of the areas that make up the broad SEN um, expenditure line. So I can tell you that on special schools, our costs this year are about £141 million. Special educational provision in mainstream is £174 million. Our pupil support for SEN is about £28 million. And the transport element of our SEN cost is about £38 million. So, Chair, I take completely your point. 
I, I would reiterate again, we are absolutely crystal clear within the, the education authority and as a department around the pressures on this budget, and they've been working very, very closely with us and successfully this year in securing an additional £51 million. Pounds. But if there's something that can be done to improve the optics of that budget, then we would absolutely be supportive of that approach. Chair, can just, uh, I think the, the, the last phrase that uh, she misused there, um, uh, really, the optics uh, of it, I think that when you come to discuss the budget proposals uh, within the chamber, um, I think it is, would be, uh, certainly for myself, would be helpful to try and understand. Um, and, and I think the, the, the committee, Seamus, have been uh, very supportive of, of uh, addressing the needs for special education uh, over the two years that we've been here. Uh, and I think that optics would be helpful to us uh, as we make the case for investment in education uh, direct to the uh, Minister for Finance. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Thanks. Is that final question there, Robin? Yeah, happy enough. Sorry, Chair. No, I, uh, I'm, as I said, I, I don't have the meeting pack with me today. That's so okay. No problem. Understand. Uh, content. With no, no problem. And Seamus's answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA, please? Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. And uh, thank you, Sarah. Thanks for being with us. I know time is, is, uh, is tight, so uh, I'll go straight to it. The Comptroller and Auditor General's report of 2017 highlighted that the number of children with SEN was rising. This is something well rehearsed at this committee. Uh, we also uh, we are also well aware that the number of children and young people with very complex SEN uh, needs is growing uh, as well. So, with this in mind, why are we receiving reports, Sarah, that the new long-awaited special school in Derry, Ardnashi, uh, will have less capacity than the existing provision? Uh, is catering for. It's a very alarming uh, revelation. Uh, and also, uh, if that is the case, does the EA not accept that the new school should have been larger than the existing provision in line with the clear uh, and evidence-based growing need in terms of SEM? Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, what I would say, Daniel, is that we absolutely recognise the um, growing increase in SEN and, and obviously um, in terms of the complexity of that need. And that is why we have um, brought forward our special um, educational needs area plan. Um, and I think that has been very significant for us as an authority. That is the first time that we have had such a plan for special dedicated for special educational needs and it will allow us to look at the capacity of all of the schools right across the special school estate um, and allow us to plan in, in a better way for placing children as, as we described earlier um, in the longer term so that we are much more proactive in that approach um, and less reactive in that approach. In relation to the actual footprint of the new school in Arden Shea, um, I am not aware of the detail of that, Daniel, um, and uh, I wouldn't want to comment on it, um, not being aware of the detail, but it's certainly something we will go away then and find out. Um, it would be unusual for us to build a school smaller than the existing provision, I have to say, so I would really need to understand that. Yeah, th 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 thanks, Sarah. The, the principal of the new school is well on record, outlining the concerns in terms of capacity, uh, as are uh, others. I'm not throwing this up in any way to be awkward. I recognise that work uh, uh, and continued work has, has been ongoing with the Education Authority to tackle uh, the growing need uh, of uh, our SEN uh, uh, children across uh, Northern Ireland. I do get concerned, though, when we are building new schools that aren't fit to meet the capacity demand uh, uh, that is uh, very clearly needed. and. If this principal is saying that, and a huge amount of public money has been spent in providing this fantastic facility, but it is not big enough to cope with the demand, then we are in a, an, an issue. And, and, and I, I just really would struggle to understand how that would happen, given that the increased demand for SEN 
uh, in terms of SEM complex need um, has been on an upward trend for quite a number of years. Yeah, Daniel, um, as I say, I don't have the detail here with me. Um, I, I do recall as the Director of Operations and Estates that the business case was changed to increase the size and footprint of that school. Um, so I, I, I am not clear what the current position is, but I, I will find out. But you're absolutely right. The point of our special uh, our special needs area plan is so that we can be proactive in our approach and that we can ensure that we have the fit, right size fit for purpose buildings to meet the needs of the population um, and to allow us to stop being reactive in our approach and proactive. So that is, is you know, a, a, key, a clear goal for us. I, I appreciate that we don't always and are not always aligning our area planning. We being the education system, our area planning and our capital development program, um, and, and you'll know that yourself, um, in, in always the, the right speed or the right way. Um, but I do believe we have an opportunity through your special needs area plan to be able to try to do that, um, and we are committed to doing that. Yeah, I, I welcome the plan. I, I think I think the, the, the issue is that the uh, new provision is smaller than, uh, the, or the, the, new, the new school will be smaller than the existing school. I think that's where I, I understand you haven't got the detail, but I think that's where it's at. I'm really pointing this out because we can't afford to be in that situation. And, and I'm sure when you um, get time to look at it, you'll, you'll, you'll most likely probably agree. But moving on, Sarah, and, and uh, again, in relation to the Controller and Auditor General's report of 2017, it also concluded that neither the Department for Education nor the Education Authority could demonstrate value for money in terms of economy, efficiency or effectiveness in providing support to children with special educational needs in mainstream schools. The November 2020 report repeated uh, those concerns, as did the Public Accounts Committee report in February of last year, February 2021. What progress has the Education Authority made towards being able to demonstrate value for money and further to that taking each of these areas in turn can you tell us briefly how you have made progress in the areas of economy efficiency and effectiveness and i probably appreciate that you're, you're going to make reference to the new sen area plan okay thank you daniel and um, what i would say is um that that uh, was a very clear recommendation from the audit office and the pac um report uh, the the effectiveness of the classroom assistant model um, and therefore reviewing the effectiveness of the interventions, which, which is where the key spend is in SEN, um, will be part of the DE independent review of SEN services. Um, and again, that will be commissioned by DE um, and we are awaiting that. And I think that will provide us with a very significant body of research, both as to why um, numbers in SEN in Northern Ireland are higher than elsewhere, but also in terms of the effectiveness of some of that intervention. Um, and that will be a very clear and very significant and important piece of research for, for us all. Um, we are not in the Education Authority um, doing nothing then while we wait for DE to conclude its research. We have run a pilot um, in terms of alternative models for um, uh, assistance for children with the SEN in mainstream classes and um, supporting the learner journey pilot uh, that is being run in a large post-primary school in West Belfast in order to test the effectiveness um, of what might what alternative um, models might offer or might bring um, and alongside that we are supporting schools in the implementation of the said act which is obviously a DE responsibility, but part of that will be the personalised learning plans. And those personalised learning plans should allow us at a system level for the first time to be able to track um, progress and achievement um, for our children with SEN in the right and appropriate way. Um, so there are a range of, 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 if you like, things underway, but I think the key Part of that will be the DE research, um, and I think it will be significant for us understanding and designing services moving forward. In it. Is there yeah. anything else you would want to add? Yeah, I, th I think it's important just to say that you know this is very much in our agenda, trying to make sure that we're efficient and effective uh, in meeting the needs of our children. 
Um, certainly, for example, in statutory assessment, I think it's a good example of that in terms of achievement efficiency. We, we carried out a process mapping exercise and we took out any duplication or any, any, um, any activities within that process in order to make this much more slick and more efficient. And I think we've seen the results of that. Um, we also have, um, I suppose, our, our SEND outline business case is a really critical piece because really it's through that transformation agenda that we really we achieve the real value for money and efficiency. Um, there are 13 work streams um, within that program and it's really they're, they're interrelated. Um, whilst they're standalone projects and we've been delivered like that, they are they are interrelated. And it's really through that work over the next, um, hopefully, pending a, a, a decision on funding. It's really that work over the next 18 months to two years that will really um, secure the real value for money that we that we that is much needed. Yeah, and and I understand that's not an easy task, and I understand that the, this particular area is pressured, but absolutely an area of clear need for prioritisation. There are so many. Uh, children and young people that are struggling and as are their families through lack of support uh, and I do appreciate that work is ongoing to improve services but I, I just need to know even though there are uh, significant and serious challenges in terms of uh, finance uh, for education for the education authority and and schools generally uh, we really need a reassurance that this is a huge area of priority uh, for the education authority uh, given where the journey we've been through in the last few years with the many, many difficulties and challenges faced by families in terms of SEM. It's our absolute priority, um, Daniel, and you have our commitment to continue um, with that uh, improvement journey and to continue um, to uh, transform these services. And as Una says, the real transformation will happen when we can see that earlier intervention um, earlier stage three intervention and access to services at stage three um, and that is entirely what our outline business case is is predicated on except Sarah, that 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 is so critical and I, and I agree absolutely with you and I, I do have to say uh, that since you have taken over as chief executive considerable changes have come about there is a huge amount of work ongoing we do appreciate this is a very challenging uh, area uh, but at all times obviously uh, we're uh, very concerned about the children and young people uh, uh, in this process but we do understand you're, you're doing all you can with the resources available uh, to you at the present time so i do appreciate the reassurance that this is an area of considerable priority uh, chair can i indulge you slightly on a budgetary question and then i'll go ahead uh, Sir, you've, you've informed us that school budgets are looking increasingly vulnerable and that the problem is a, sis, a systemic funding one rather than one related to per management. Uh, this is an alarming uh, message, uh, something I would agree with. Uh, but in keeping with several reports that this committee has been presented with, what evidence has uh, convinced the Education Authority that the funding problem is a systemic one? Uh, and further that, would you also accept that our education system is in England, Scotland and Wales for many, many years. Daniel, I got your first question was, was, was on what evidence does, did we base our statement that this was a systemic rather than a poor management issue, but you cut out just for your second question, sorry. W would you accept further that compared to England, Scotland or Wales, it, the education system in Northern Ireland has been uh, significantly underfunded? Okay, I'm going to hand directly to Seamus um, to, to provide you with an answer to that, um, Daniel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I guess, Daniel, to pick up your, your first question, um, my LMS teams have been engaging for a number of years with all of the schools right across the sectors around their financial planning. And I guess then, uh, as the year progresses, uh, the, the financial positions they find themselves in, I guess the, the evidence coming back to me from those teams is that principals are, uh, in their words, at their wit's end. They, they recount situations where the schools have full enrolment, where they have reduced costs, where they have moved from a, a non-teaching principle situations to a teaching principle, where they have reduced overheads, and effectively they have done everything they can, including composite classes, etc., to, to, to live within their financial means. And yet, they find a situation where despite all of those factors and despite meeting the sustainable schools criteria in all other respects, they simply can't make ends meet. 
and they're at the point where they feel they can do no more without seriously adversely affecting the educational outcomes for children and young people. So um, I, I guess a couple of other points to make. Um, you will have heard me say in the past that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought a temporary reprieve to the financial pressures that schools have been facing. Um, uh, whilst there has been an improvement in the overall school's position, nonetheless, we are predicting at the end of this financial year that 41% of our schools will still have a financial deficit. The scale of this problem, uh, Daniel, to answer your question, the scale of the problem, coupled with the anecdotal evidence that we've uh, had from feedback from many, many of our schools, including some of the direct conversations that myself and the Director of Education have had with individual schools, would indicate to us very, very clearly that this is more than simply a case of poor management. Uh, so okay. that, that was really your first question. Sorry, your second question again, Daniel, was what? Uh, just in comparison to other jurisdictions such as England, Scotland and Wales, uh, do you believe that uh, the education system here in Northern Ireland has been underfunded for years? Yeah, so um, I think the Department of Education would accept that that's the case in terms of the, the comparison of the funding. Um, I, I will remind members again that um, since 2010-11, the education budget has suffered a real times reduction of about £230 million. Okay. And in very simple terms, what that means is, had we simply received an inflationary rise since 2010-11, our budget would now be £230 million more than it actually is. And that's before we look at the significant increases in demand in relation to special educational needs. And then finally, Chair, you will, you will have heard from me in the past that in order to try and support schools as best we can, the Education Authority has um, also generated cash releasing savings from its block grant budget of about £120 million since its establishment. And actually, this year, we're projecting that that will increase by about another 7 million. So when you take all that into account, the department tells us that the comparison with uh, the rest of the UK, we do not fare well. And when we look at the real terms reduction and the cash releasing savings we have generated ourselves, that would indicate that uh, there's a funding problem for Northern Ireland schools. Uh, absolutely, and I do appreciate your honesty. The, the, we're receiving considerable reports at the present time from very large schools that are sustainable uh, from every aspect uh, that they are struggling to make ends meet. And it's a very alarming situation, particularly given the wider financial context of the challenges that have been faced by schools, by the Education Authority. Um, it, it's, it's certainly something, unfortunately, that is directly uh, affecting our children. Uh, but I appreciate that. Thanks very much for taking uh, questions. Thanks, Daniel. D just to build on, on one of your, your questions and your point there as well, Daniel, to the team, um, the, look, the, the, the bar for SEND provision when, when a number of you came into post was systemic failure. That, that's, that's where the bar was. It, was. it was that systemic failure for special education needs provision, so it couldn't have got much lower. Um, but I think Daniel is right and it, and it is correct of the Education Committee to acknowledge that the reduction in statutory assessments beyond the 26 weeks has reduced significantly, significantly. Um, and we hope that that has had a positive impact on the children and young people that need and deserve that additional support. We know as Sarah, as you've acknowledged, we're not there yet in terms of that system functioning exactly as how it needs to. But it, it is it is right that the Education Committee acknowledged that there has been significant progress in that regard. Can I, before I, I, I bring other members in on that, can, can I ask um, that the, uh, much of the, the system improvement um, falls to the children and young people's directorate which has a, an interim director at this moment in time. How, how long has that director been interim? And what, what, if any, risk is there 
in it being interim and at what point will it be permanent? Okay, Chair, um, Una has been the interim director um, of Children and Young People Services since March 2020. I cannot comment on when that may become permanent. Um, what I can say is that um, I have every confidence in Una and her leadership and her leadership of that directorate and that team. Um, and I believe that she has led significant transformation there. So from that perspective, in terms of, of risk, I, I am content at this moment in time. Do, do, do my best not to personalize it too much, but I entirely agree with you, Sarah. I, I don't, we're, not, we're not allowed to do this often perhaps, but I, I think Una Turbot has done a, a super job in that role. Um, and I, I, I suppose my, my question was more around the um, the, the the system. I, I can't imagine any organisation would want a, a post to be interim for for too long. And I suppose you're looking at two years there. Um, is is the aim of the EA to to make that a permanent post? Chair, I can't comment on that at this moment in time. But I am. Okay. I thank you for your acknowledgement um, of the hard work and dedication of Una, and in fact, all of that Children and Young People Services team, because I think, as you said at the outset, um, they really did go above and beyond um, their routine jobs uh, to, to really get in behind this service transformation and to really get in behind clearing those backlogs. And as you say, um, the impact that that will have had on children and young people will be significant. Yeah, I, I agree. And look, the education committee might want to ask further questions in relation to to the the, the post rather than the person, um, and the, the 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 need to make that a, a permanent post. But to to reiterate again, um, I I think Una has done a, an outstanding job, and the team have have have, as you say, achieved significant change for uh, a, a sound provision that was in, in system failure. So it's important that we recognize that. Um, sorry, I can't look at any of you in the eye when I'm saying that because of the visuals, but thank you, thank you for, for the work. Um, can I bring in um, Diane Dodds, MLA, please, thanks. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you to Sarah. A couple of questions, one which is slightly different on the SEN um, issue. It is really good to see that there are only, I think you quoted 11 cases in the system, more than 26 weeks. And that's, as Chris says, a massive improvement from the kind of situation that we have been in um, for some time. But I'm really interested in the interventions that we need before people get into that um, system and how we can work with you um, to ensure that schools are equipped with the, the resources that they need um, both in, the, in manpower and in funding to ensure that, that that situation is not exacerbated again and, and that we reach young people really, really early. And I'm thinking about, I was in Carrick Primary School in Lurgan on Friday and for a completely different reason. But one of the things that really sparked my interest was that they had people trained as OTs, they had speech and language therapists on site um, and that they had a whole lot of interventions that they delivered, both health and educational interventions that they delivered on site. And I kind of think that that, even if it means schools clustering to have those um, interventions, is part of the way forward. Um, are, are there plans to look at that? Because we, we don't have the money to do it for every school, but we could certainly do it for clusters of schools. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, our, our outline business case that really 
if you like, is the key to the transformational change that we need to achieve is absolutely predicated on earlier intervention and earlier support for stage three services. And as you say, that's both equipping the schools uh, with the support that they need, but also enhancing our stage three services. And it is our aspiration that in doing that, we then reduce the reliance on uh, requiring a statement of special yeah. educational needs yeah. to actually access the services that you require, but actually that all children access those services. I'm going to ask Una to comment a bit on terms of our we, health are, are intricately involved in this transformation program with us. We have been continuing to grow and develop our relationship with health. And, and, and actually the pandemic um, has been um, very helpful to us actually in that space. I don't think we've ever been working closer with our colleagues in health um, and that again allows us to broaden those discussions. But um, Una, do you want to say a bit more about? Um, yeah, certainly we have a range of people support services um, that work at that earlier intervention level and the more we can work with health to collaborate and, and, and to maximise our joint models, our funding models and, and that um, I think the more efficient we're going to be and the more responsive we're going to be. And we know that early intervention saves saves costs and also is, is a better experience for, for our children and our schools and our families. Um, we have obviously the high incidence um, areas such as, as, as literacy and, and, and autism, for example. But we have other children, for example, and I met yesterday with, with um, brain injury matters. Um, again, a local charity, and we talked about the low incidence, but equally for each of those children, um, the significance of, of making sure that they have the right support and that their needs are understood um, by all schools. I think as part of the, the part of the work that we've done recently to support um, the schools, the mainstream provisions, the 70 odd um, additional mainstream provisions that have been set up, certainly since we started this work, we have established a, multi, a multidisciplinary team and ATI are reviewing that. Um, the feedback, the interim feedback that we're getting is positive in that approach. Uh, we would have liked, for example, OTs and speech and language therapists to be part of that team, but unfortunately because of COVID they were called to, to other duties within health, but that door is certainly open and, and um, we're very keen through the transformation pro project and programme to, to really galvanise those relationships and make sure that the models that we come up with um, are are can be delivered with fidelity, can be delivered knowing that if we do this, we are likely to get an outcome for that child and, and for, for the populations that we, the, the groups of children that we that we serve. Um, and we need to find models that are sustainable, affordable, sustainable, and that make a difference. So um, again, as Sarah says, it goes back to making sure that we use the opportunity of the transformation program to achieve that systemic um, change that's much needed. Um, Chair, just with your permission, um, just to come back on that, because I, I do think that this is important. It's interesting you say that COVID, and I've often thought this about the economy and other areas, COVID was kind of both a disruptor and an accelerator of things that we might have done, but that we had to do um, because of COVID. Um, but the, the other element of this is, it's just how slowly the wheels of change in this particular area have been grinding along for a very, very long time. Um, I mean, I can remember um, when I was first elected um, 20 years ago um, in West Belfast, many primary schools were talking about these kind of interventions. Um, and we're only really talking about it now in formal terms of a, a program of change and a program of that's more cohesive between health and education because it's both it's good for both um and i that that if i was if i was sort of given out one message it would be around 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 that particular issue um i i, I have questions on on the budget but maybe if we're going to have a full session on the budget we'll wait until then is that yeah, no problem, Diane. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Diane. Uh, Justin McNulty, MLA, please. Thanks. Chair, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Una Seamus. Sir, how long are you in your job? 
I took a post on the 1st of April 2019, Justin. 2019. Describe for me the difference between before you and your job, sir, and now, as relating to uh, children with special education needs and their families. So, Justin, I suppose, as I've said earlier, I think we have now embarked on, on what we believe to be a, a systemic transformation programme for children with special educational needs. Um, and that is something that, as Diane has referenced, um, we have had ambitions for for some time, but we are now really wanting to accelerate that. So we know that um, our own internal audit of practice in statutory operations showed us that um, early in, in 2020, um, as I said, there were over a thousand children who were waiting um, beyond 26 weeks for their statutory assessment and that they were waiting for a significant amount of time as well. Um, and the Children and Young People Services Directorate have embarked in a significant programme of change um, and in making those services more efficient um, and more effective. But we remain ambitious for our systemic transformation, for really getting serious about early intervention um, and prevention and access to stage three services. And that, as I say, is what the outline business case for our um, overall service transformation is predicated on. Okay. Um, are you making a difference, sir? Is the education authority making a difference to children with, with special education needs and their families? Are you hitting the ground running? You know, you can talk to me about systemic transformation. I want to know, are you making a difference to children and their families? You and your organization, are you making a difference here and now? And is there a difference between before you took a post and now? Yes, Justin, I hope so. I believe that we have made a difference to those children. We had significant numbers of children waiting beyond 26 weeks. And I believe that we have made a difference to those children and those families in their ability to access um, services. Um, and I believe that we can make a further difference um, when we uh, get our stage three early intervention services um, reformed in the same way that we have our statutory operations services. A bit of peace here, Sarah and Una and Seamus. Um, James, James, uh, what's his second name? Kerwin wrote a book on the All Blacks called Pre uh, called Legacy, detailing how the best sporting team in the world, how they built the culture around that team. And one of their core philosophies was pressure is a privilege. Now, I ask, I say that because is there a, in within the culture of the education authority? The people who work there, the people who do the job that's so important for the children who need the support and help to get the foot up that they need to become the people they can become. Is there a sense that it's a privilege, the job that you have as, as chief executive, the job of each of you in your organization has, it's a privilege for you to be able to help the children get a leg up in education. Does, is that culture, does that culture exist in the Education Authority right now? Absolutely, Justin, and we have done an awful lot of work with our staff and with our teams around the culture of the Education Authority, around our values, around values determining our behaviours, around how we work and how we operate. Um, as I said earlier, that doesn't mean that sometimes we don't get it wrong. We always will, um, and there will always be mistakes made. But in terms of our values and our drive for excellence, um, I think that is embedded right through the Education Authority, and certainly it is embedded in this corporate leadership team. That's brilliant to hear that, sir, and very reassuring. And to understand that the, the real massive difference you're making to the lives of children and, and by extension their families, it's extraordinary, the importance and the power of the work you're doing. So I wish you luck and continue to on the, on the journey that you're on. I know by you as a person that you're determined and committed to make it, making a difference on you and your team, likewise. We mentioned earlier in terms of educational uh, welfare officers and that the pandemic has obviously exacerbated the challenges within families, within households, especially relating to lockdown. There's so many additional pressures brought on, brought to bear on families as a consequence of that. And the knock on effect on that for children in education has been extreme. Educational welfare officers provide a crucially important role in their, their uh, helping families navigate 
education, helping children and families navigate the education as a consequence of familial breakup and other issues. How do you feel about the disparity in their recognition from a pay, pay standard uh, as opposed to their equivalence in the Department for Health, their, their, their equivalence in the health trusts? Is that reasonable? Is that fair? And what representations are you making on their behalf to ensure pay equity? Now, there has been offers already around pay which they do not accept um, and, and in relation to specialists because they're all specialists, they feel strongly. What's the Education Authority's position and what, how are you happy to have that matter resolved? Okay, Justin, you'll understand that our negotiations are ongoing with NIPSA and therefore being in a formal negotiating process, we are limited in what we can say. What I will say to you is that our education and welfare officer role is being reviewed to ensure that we can meet the needs of children and young people. The role provides an important service in promoting and supporting positive attendance at school, and it has been reviewed through engagement with families, schools, children and young people. Sorry, that's my bottle and hitting the table there. We are committed to negotiations with NIPSA and to find a resolution to Education and Welfare Officer Pay. The pay dispute and constructive engagement is ongoing. We will continue to do everything possible to make sure that the needs of the children and young people who use the service are addressed throughout this period. I'm very worried about that, sir, because I met, met the Education Welfare Officers a number of times on the picket lines, and they're still picketing, and they're still they're angry, they're upset, and they feel very undervalued on the crucially important role they play. It's not right that they should feel such, and the pressure they're under for them as a group of people to feel undervalued. To the extent that they do, it's, it's very unreasonable. Uh, but I, I understand that the negotiations are ongoing, but I, I, I felt strongly it's important to represent their their, their feelings. Um, Sir, tell me, what, what do you think about the fact that the department do not know what sports facilities schools have? And, um, at, and the, the extent to which so many children have not more than one hour's physical activity a week, both in primary sector and in, in post-primary sector. What are your thoughts in relation to that? Okay, Justin, I'll ask him to comment on the, the, the curriculum aspect of that in terms of, of the PE curriculum. Um, th thanks, Sarah. Um, I, I, as you know, the Northern Ireland curriculum has inbuilt flexibility in terms of not the content, because of course physical education is part of the statutory curriculum, but the time allocated to that content. And that has been quite a game changer in terms of how this curriculum has moved on. So, so the idea that the curriculum is an infu a skills-infused curriculum that schools and boards of governors can determine the time set out for each of those areas is certainly what the, the, the new Northern Ireland curriculum is about. So in terms of the, the time that schools devote to delivering the PE curriculum, that will be determined through the curriculum policy um, through the Boards of Governors. It is absolutely recognised and understood that children's physical activity is of extreme importance and everything that schools can do, even you know, out with the, the main formal curriculum, through extracurriculars, through sports activities, even the Daily Mile that we have seen a lot of primary schools um, taking up is all really, really encouraging. So we will, of course, continue to encourage schools to have a broad and balanced curriculum, which includes um, a, a, you know, the, the PE allocation that, 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 that the children need and deserve. Um, unfortunately, we don't have subject specialists anymore within the old CAS service, which would have been what we would have had in the old um, education and library boards. However, we do support the school holistically in terms of their you know, school development planning through our school improvement services. Now, Kim, that's a bit worrying to me. You're saying that the Board of Governors can essentially determine that uh, no, we're not that interested in PE in the school and that won't, then kids won't actually avail of it as a consequence. Is that, is that what you're saying? The, the, the curriculum is set as a statutory curriculum, so PE, they must deliver on PE, but how they deliver on PE is set through the curriculum policy for individual schools. So PE so, might not necessarily involve physical exercise? They, they can't determine that they will not cover physical exercise. They must have physical exercise in their school curriculum, yes. But as to the extent of it, that's not prescribed? That's right. That's that's worrying. 
worrying um, that it's, it's an ad hoc approach to PE. Uh, PE should be front and centre, in my mind, um, of any curriculum. Um, but Kim, that's apologies. I didn't I didn't note you your your um, attendance earlier. So thank you for your um, contributions. And it's James Kerr, not James Kerr, when he wrote Legacy. Uh, listen, thank you all very much, and best of luck on your your very important work going forward. Thank you so thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. I think there's a clear need for a committee inquiry into physical education. We're pressed for time, so I'm not saying any more than that. But I leave that leave that with the, the next committee. Um, I think I think that's all members um, have asked questions at, at this stage. Uh, folks, can I, I say thank you for your, your time with us today. Um, I, I, I think this is likely to be the, the last uh, time with you before the end of the mandate. There is plenty for um, the, the next education committee to engage with you on, um, but this, this could be the last time that I engage with you in this role. So, um, thank you for the, the privilege it has been for me. Justin spoke about privilege earlier. Um, it has been a privilege for me to serve in this role and a, and a, uh, and, and a, a privilege for me to get to interact with the, the senior representatives of the Education Authority, given the level of responsibility and opportunity that you have to deliver in education for children and young people in Northern Ireland. So thank you. Thank you for that opportunity, and and we wish you um, every success in the in the coming months before the the next education committee is able to engage with you again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Chair. On behalf of myself and the corporate leadership team, can we wish you well um, and every success in your new chapter and your new journey? Thank you, and thank you to the committee again for all your support um, for us throughout the last two years and your challenge which we accept fully as an integral part of your role. Thank you. Thanks, folks. All the best. OK, Clark, can we remove the witnesses from the spotlight and update us on any actions further to that briefing? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, there was a lot of recognition um, in that session, now recognition of work by the sector, um, work recognition of where... Um, EA has has moved from um, over 1,000 um, uh, late cases, like over 26 week cases in 2019 to only 11 um, that are taking more than 26 weeks at the moment. Um, and the uh, the work and review that have gone on in, in terms of value for money and um, trying to improve the uh, value for money reassurance of the organisation. Um, the EA is doing some work on the classroom assistant um, model effectiveness um, and personalised learning plans in the implementation of the Act, which will give more of a steer on, on value for money. Also, the process mapping exercise that's taken place. Um, a lot of a lot of this systemic transformation that needs to happen is is um, up against systemic funding. Problems. Um, so I think there was just you know a lot of detail and also kind of high level um, uh, realization of some of the challenges that the organisation is facing. Um, particular questions that we might want to go back um, either to the EA or to the minister on chair. Um, um, you had an inquiry about oh. making permanent um, the important post of uh, director of children and young people, which has been an interim post since 2020, um, the, the witnesses didn't um, uh, feel that there was a particular risk there organisationally, um, uh, that wouldn't be best practice. Um, also, um, assurance on the broader budget position, you know, is there any possibility of um, a more, um, a, a clearer funding line for EA? Um, and I mean, it was reflected there that there, you know there's not been an inflationary rise since 2010-11, um, so there's a really significant gap um, in the budget. Um, Daniel had a question about the capacity of Lisna Lisna She um, for the rising numbers that it needs to cater to, and um, then Diane wanted to query, um, you know, how cluster models could be used to. Uh, facilitate the early intervention um, that will re will reduce reliance on on statementing. So there are some questions to go back um, 
on chair and um, i mean justin did, were you satisfied with your answer there about the education and welfare officers um no obviously they're they're in negotiations uh, so i understand um i mean that they can't provide any more information right now but i think it's something we as a committee should be supporting for the educational welfare officers in terms of their demands yeah i mean there'll be an opportunity tomorrow as well to speak to the teaching unions um that might be relevant there um and the the substitute teacher manifesto um but we've agreed earlier in the meeting to to write um as well the only other thing that i just thought was notable about the ea presentation was just the word fidelity in the middle of it you know uh, value on a values level fidelity to the children in the system um Thanks for that, Clark. Thank yeah. you, Clark. Thanks, Clark. Um, can I, yeah, can I, can I just clarify as well, maybe that we add in that in terms of actions to write to the A to seek a, an update on the appointment of a permanent director of children and young people and any associated processes. Um, I, I think a, a two-year interim post should be of some concern to to anyone. Um, so it'd be good to, to get clarity on that if that's okay. Members members can tend to agree that action too. Agreed. Okay. Members can tend to agree all other actions as raised by the clerk. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, members. Um, then agenda item eight is any other business? No. No, okay. Then the date and time of our next meeting is tomorrow, Thursday, the 10th of March, by starting at 9 a.m. with the Northern Ireland Teaching Council. And there are a number of issues there, obviously, we'll want to raise with them. Um, so we look forward to that. Um, the committee meeting then does now adjourn. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Thank Jeff. you. Thanks, members. Thanks, Thanks